2 Samuel 16, verse 23, And the counsel of Ahidophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahidophel, both with David and Absalom. Ahidophel had a well-deserved reputation for giving counsel almost as good as God. Ahidophel was not a regular man. He was wise. He had a wisdom that very few men can attain. He was gifted. Kings would come to him because he communicated with God Almighty. I am not talking about regular people would come to him. No, men like David, men like David who were hand-picked and chosen by God would come to Ahidophel for counsel and advice. Men like David, who are described as being a man after God's own heart, would come to Ahidophel for counsel. Ahidophel was gifted. Ahidophel spoke as the oracle of God. He was a unique man. Look here. We are told that the counsel of Ahidophel was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. Ahidophel was not an average man, but yet he is someone that a lot of Christians have never ever heard of. He was a man who was a leading counsellor for David for many years, and a relationship between him and David formed. They fellowshiped together. David described Ahidophel as his own friend in Psalm 41 verse 9. These men were close. 2 Samuel 17 verse 23 And when Ahidophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose, and got him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order, and hanged himself and died, and was buried in the sepulchre of his father. Now the question is, why did this wise man Ahidophel commits suicide? The answer to this question, we have to look to the Bible. And the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel 23 verse 34 that Ahidophel had a son named Eliam. The fact that he had a son named Eliam becomes more significant when David inquired about Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11 verse 3 which says, and David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? By this scriptural account, we find that Bathsheba was the granddaughter of Ahitophel. We all know about the story of David and Bathsheba. Now the thing about Bathsheba that a lot of people forget is that she had a family. But we only ever hear about her murdered husband Uriah. But Bathsheba had a family. She had a mother and a father, and she had a grandfather called Ahitophel. Ahitophel loved her like any grandfather loves their grandchildren. You haven't known love yet until you have grandchildren. And Ahitophel loved his grandchild Bathsheba, and he had to watch David ruin her life. Her life was ruined because of David. Bathsheba had been happily married to Uriah, whose name means Light of Jehovah. Uriah was a commander in David's army. He had been passionately in love with Bathsheba and died, never knowing of his wife's adultery and dishonor. Although Ahitophel hated David for what he did, he carried on working counseling David for over eight years, waiting, waiting and waiting. Ahitophel carried that grudge for years, and David never knew it. David had absolutely no idea. Ahitophel was part of the rebellion with Absalom, David's son. When Ahitophel saw that his advice to Absalom to attack David immediately and kill him was rejected, 
He knew that David would come out the victor and there was no future for him. So he went home, related the events to his family, and according to Josephus, he went into an inner room and hanged himself. And the family buried him. Now the question is, what led this man to taking his own life? Bitterness. The counsel of Ahitophel was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God, yet bitterness consumed him. Ahitophel was a wise man, yet bitterness consumed him. Yes, what David did was wrong. Yes, what David did was immoral. To go after a married man and have that married woman's husband killed because he committed adultery with his wife. But David made amends with the Lord and the Lord forgave him. But Ahitophel was full of unforgiveness. He wanted vengeance. Ahitophel wanted to be the judgment of the Lord. He waited and took his time. And just as I am preaching right now, there is someone who is in the same situation as Ahitophel. People have wronged you. I am not for one second justifying what they did to you. What they did to you was wrong. What they did to you was immoral. What they did to you was sick and vindictive. No one is justifying their action, but you have to forgive. Do not allow bitterness to consume you like it did to Ahitophel. Bitterness can consume your very soul. It can take all the joy in your life away. I remember preaching this sermon in front of a church congregation, and whilst looking into the congregation's eyes, I saw it all. I saw bitterness. I saw pain. I saw heartbreak. I saw betrayal. I saw tears. But I am here reminding you, you have to forgive. You cannot hold grudges. Forgiveness. Forgive. 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 You have to forgive. Unforgiveness is quite literally poisonous. Unforgiveness quite literally has the power to suck the very life out of your soul. Unforgiveness will eat away at you quietly. Unforgiveness will chip away at your health. Unforgiveness will quite literally consume an individual. Unforgiveness will destroy your marriage. Let me say that one more time. Unforgiveness will destroy your marriage. Someone needs to hear this today. Unforgiveness will destroy your marriage. At its very core, unforgiveness is poisonous, and the poison destroys you and you alone. Bitterness, resentment, hatred, animosity, and so many children of God are struggling with this area of unforgiveness. The joy of the Lord is no longer in their life because of unforgiveness. There is no joy in the life of a person who is full of unforgiveness. Bitterness will take your life away and make you quite literally a walking zombie. Years pass, and you are still angry at things someone did to you in your past. Bitterness, resentment, hatred, animosity. I am not saying for one moment that what they did to you was right. I am not trying to justify what they did to you. Yes, they wronged you. Yes, they mistreated you, but you have to let it go. And I am not for one second downplaying what they have done to you. I am not for one second justifying their actions. But I am here to simply remind you, you have to forgive. Not for their sake, but for your own. Bitterness will consume you. 
Yes, that man or woman stole years of your life away. Years you will never get back. But you have to forgive. Bitterness will eat you alive. It will take the very life out of your body. Yes, you are existing. Yes, your heart is pumping blood all across your body. But there is no life in you anymore because of bitterness. Unforgiveness is quite literally a dark shadow that will cover every aspect of your life if you let it. I don't know who needs to hear this, but there are people who quite literally walk every single day of their life with heaviness, a sense of heaviness. They have all this bitterness and unforgiveness weighing them down. Allow me to make it clear that when you forgive, you do not gloss over or deny the seriousness of an offense against you. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting nor does it mean condoning or excusing offences. You are not condoning what they did. What they did was wrong, and they will have to answer to the Lord about their offence. But all forgiveness is, is quite simply letting go. Letting go of bitterness. Letting go of all resentment. Letting go of all hatred letting go of all animosity. Forgive and let go. Let there be peace. Let there be joy among you and your neighbors, your colleagues and your family. Forgive and the Lord will bless you. Forgiveness brings the forgiver peace of mind and frees him or her from corrosive anger. It requires letting go of deeply held negative feelings. Forgiveness empowers you to recognize the pain you suffered without letting that pain define you, thereby enabling you to heal and move on with your life. Enoch, the prophet of judgment. The Bible is not a closed book as some people may call it. Within the Bible, God has revealed to us mysteries. The Mystery of the Indwelling of the Holy Spirit Colossians 1 verse 26 and 27 The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery of the rapture is revealed within the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. The mystery of Jews and Gentiles being molded into one body. Ephesians 3 verse 6 This mystery is that through the Gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. The Bible reveals mysteries. However, within the Bible, there are some characters who till this day remain a mystery. One of which is Melchizedek, who is probably the single most mysterious figure in the Bible. Melchizedek was a priest king of Salem, later known as Jerusalem in the time of Abraham. Another character in the Bible who is covered in mystery is the destroyer, the angel of the bottomless pit, Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. There are many more characters within the Bible who are shrouded in mystery, but the individual we are going to focus on today is a man who never died, Enoch, the man who never died. 
Enoch is discussed in both the books of Genesis and Jude. The book of Genesis featured Enoch's walk with God and a brief account of his lifetime and how God transited him from the world without allowing him to taste death while the book of Jude featured the prophetic dimension of Enoch's life. Only two people in the Bible, Enoch and Elijah, are taken straight to heaven. Without having to experience death, a number of biblical scholars speculate that the two witnesses that are spoken of in the book of Revelation are these two individuals, who do in fact experience death briefly in Revelation 11 verse 7 to 12. The Bible reveals to us that Enoch was Adam's great, 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 great grandson and Noah's great grandfather, and that he lived a holy and faithful life to the Lord. He lived a life of faithfulness, a life of devotion, a life of complete and utter loyalty. Two times in the fifth chapter of Genesis, Enoch is described as walking faithfully with God. Now, allow me to take a detour for a moment to encourage you, my brother and sisters, that you can walk faithfully with God. Even in the generation that encourages sin, in this generation that glorifies sin, in this generation that blasphemes the name of the Lord, you can walk faithfully with God. Notice the Bible's choice of words. He did not walk ahead of God or behind God, but he walked with God. There was a communion with God and Enoch, and right now, this very day, you can walk with God. And the wonderful thing about God is that He is not a respecter of persons. He does not care about your ethnicity. He doesn't care about your nationality. He doesn't care about your height or the zeros in your bank account. If you are to make a commitment today to walk with God, God will walk with you. A life of walking with God is a life of obedience a life of submission to the will of God, to trust God, in the sense that God, I don't need to understand, but I trust you. Look at Job, another man who had an unusual relationship with God in all that Job went through. The loss of his health, wealth, and the death of his children, God, never gave him an explanation of the conversation that occurred in heaven concerning him. But nevertheless, Job trusted God. That is a life of walking with God, a life of complete and utter trust in the Lord, your God. Now back to Enoch. He was also the father of Methuselah, the longest living man. Genesis 5 verse 27. Throughout his three plus centuries on earth, he has numerous other offspring. The book of Jude was written by Jude, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. We can find out from scriptures that Jude is the half-brother of Jesus because he associated himself with James. In Matthew 13, verse 55, both James and Judas were mentioned as the brothers of Jesus. The English translation of the Gospel shortens the name Judas as Jude. Also, Jude was the brother of Christ. He became prominent as a follower of Christ after the departure of Christ from the world. In his writing, he did not refer to himself as the brother of Christ, but he called himself the servant of Jesus Christ. In this, he displayed a great level of humility and proved that he truly accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord over his life. However, the Bible didn't give us the record of how Jude came to know as the prophecy of Enoch. We do not know whether Jude found a written document of Enoch's prophecy or whether he got it 
by divine inspiration. We only know that he made a reference to the prophecy of Enoch, which is based on Christ's second advent, and how he will judge the ungodly for their wickedness. This is the prophecy of Enoch as recorded by Jude 14 and 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their heart speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. According to the epistle of Jude, Enoch received the great revelation into the second advent of Christ. He saw very far into God's plan for the end time. Although he was the seventh generation from Adam, Enoch saw beyond the first coming of Christ to the end of the world where Christ will come as the judge of the whole world to execute judgment upon the ungodly for all the sins and wickedness they have done. Now, sinners have all the time to commit their evil acts and do their wickedness. They also have the privilege of grace to repent from their evil ways and turn to the Lord and get saved before it is too late. Jesus will return with thousands of his saints to execute his righteous judgment upon the ungodly. Revelation 19 verse 11 and 14 says about the second coming of Christ, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Also in Matthew 16 verse 27 Jesus said, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now look at the relationship Enoch had with God. God showed in the future things to come. He saw thousands of years into the future to see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Enoch was the first prophet who spoke about the second coming of Christ. As far back as his time, if he could speak about the judgment which Christ will execute upon the world, then we should know that the second coming of Christ is a prophecy that must be fulfilled. Revelation 22 verse 11 and 12 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Christ has the reward of all kinds of works with him. He will not only reward the just and the righteous, he will also reward the unjust and the unrighteous according to the works they have done. The judgment of God is real. The second coming of Christ is real, as testified by this man called Enoch. Enoch is a man that we should aspire to be like, in the sense that he has a close and intermittent relationship with the Lord, so much so that God took him without experiencing death.